Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. What's up? Hey. Hey. How you doing? I'm good. Let's talk about what? <laughs> I always have a lot of anticipation for what you're wanting to talk about. I, I want to talk about a little bit of sort of our origin story. Oh, jeez. In that, you know, when we met, yeah. you were working on all of your theory and yeah. theories about learning and cognition. And oh, yeah. I was doing translational research and other things. We were both at Cornell. Yeah. And remember when we were about to get on a flight going to a conference, oh, an academic see, conference. Yeah, okay. Got it. Um, do you remember how we met, right? None of these things. Right? Well, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that you were talking about that story. No, I want people to understand why we ended up or why we started m the bulk of our work in the education system and why we decided to spend 10 years really trying to understand right. how, to, how to use the elements of what your own research was yeah. with humans, small humans. Yeah, so NSF wanted, uh, they had uh, just given us a grant. They wanted to, um, at the time, my, my theory was uh, pretty, you know, same theory that it is now, uh, but but much more difficult to understand. Yes. Um, and I mostly taught it to doctoral students and scientists and stuff like that. And, yeah. Um, and it was hard to understand. It was like, you know, mathematical and... Abstract. Abstract and just not. It's a theory. You had to work at it. Yeah. NSF uh, gave us a, a nice grant um, to work on making the theory accessible to people. Yes. And um, and so you as a translational re researcher, you might want to say what that is because people uh, don't know what that is. Translational but. research is when you take... Um, what is considered to be <clears throat> empirical or really rigorous research, and you translate it into tools and techniques by which a broader section of people can actually right. use it. You were on the grant for yes. that, I guess, and um, I guess. was on the grant <laughs> for I mean, I didn't know you at the time, so the the, the, the grant kind of brought us like, together. Who's she? Why is yeah. she here? <laughs> and um, I was on the grant because I came up with a theory, so... Yeah, yeah. Um, we, I think we met, like in your office or something. But yes. but then we pretty quickly had a trip that we had to go to a conference in yeah with the whole in, team in uh, Seattle. Yeah, was it Seattle? Yes. Yeah. Wow, so, this is really testing. Let's go. I know. I don't remember that was the good. Details of yeah. everything. But uh, so we were in the Ithaca airport waiting for our plane, and and uh, you know we were like, okay, well, so this is like the the grant, and we gotta. Get started. Yeah. So, and I said, "Do you, you got to explain this theory of yours?" Yeah. Like, so you I said, "Tell me the theory in like a short, as short, yeah. as short as possible." Yes. And um, so I, I actually had my like piece of paper ticket. Yeah. And back when tickets <clears> were paper, <throat> I scribbled kind of. I always scribble on things, so I scribbled kind of the the f different formulas and things like we that. Call that notation. Notation. Yeah. On the back of. Uh, um, on ticket. the back of the ticket. Mm -hmm. And I was impressed that you kind of picked it up pretty quick. Yeah. Because most moments. people at that time <laughs> didn't. And, um, and, and I was like, so when I, when we we're done, when I was done explaining it, I said, so, you know, what should we, what do? should we do? Mm -hmm. And you said something that really kind of blew my mind, which was, uh, you said, I know exactly what we need to do. Yeah, it was a little hubristic. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, really? What? Because I have no idea what we exactly what we have to do. So uh, you said, we need to go teach kindergartners. Yes. And that was at the beginning. And that was the beginning. Yes. And it was a great thing to do. One, one because it's, kindergartners are fun. And you didn't literally mean kindergartners. You meant kindergartners and first and graders kids. and third yeah. graders and ninth graders and all kinds of uh, different age groups right. and stuff like that. But um, we did actually teach kindergartners the theory. And yeah. it was remarkable because it immediately just kind of made it 
you had to make it practical. You had to make yeah. it, you had to make it accessible. You had to make it, you know, we had valuable. to reduce it to its most understandable, yeah. smallest unit possible, which <clears throat> meant then we could always go up. Yes. Right. Well, and what's remarkable is, you know, in 20 years of doing that. So, I mean, for the next 10 years, we literally did that and studied the act of doing that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, in the meantime. That's a whole nother the, story. You know, got married <laughs> and all that stuff. But, That's a whole nother story. But uh, it was a remarkable journey because it really, it was easily the best thing we could have done um, with, with it because it was fun. It was um, important work, and it, it I mean, I, I think I learned probably more than the kindergartners did, because I learned, I learned how to make it accessible. Well, I, I don't know if I would pit them against each other, because in a weird way, yes, we learned a lot from them, mm -hmm. but if you remember, I, there was a moment where you and I were standing in a kindergarten room in a district in Virginia mm -hmm. and all the kids were in a circle and they were I'm trying to think of which yeah. one you're talking about. There's so many times, so many different rooms. Yeah. Well, which... we were standing there and they were in a circle or in a circle, the kids, yeah. and they were talking and there was a, a kid that a, a child who raised their hand and explained with great eloquence how they had come to understand something. And it was like, we both metaphorically saw that light bulb. <clears throat> And we both got like a tear in our eye and we're like, oh, yeah, we can do this. Yeah, It was like, we can do this. Yeah. And it was a moment that I think, to me, I think it was like the origin of every ounce of motivation yeah. that has pushed us forward for 25, gosh, we're getting old, a long time. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that was a moment for me when I realized we can teach this. Yeah, it's teachable. And this is thinking. Yep. And that's very important. It's funny on the on the other side. It made me think of that. Uh, there was another moment we had where uh, I don't know all the details, but you'll you'll remember. You have a better memory than me. So um, there was a teacher, and at first they would just kind of talk about thinking, and they'd say, "You need yes. to think about that," or "You need to think." Yes, about yes. It. And there was this teacher that we were, you know, trying to help her understand how to teach thinking. Yep. Rather than just teaching information. Yeah. And she's saying, you, you know, Johnny, Bobby, whatever, you yeah, need yeah. to you need to think about that. And remember the kid came yeah. up and he says, Mrs. Wilson or whatever. Um, yeah, I remember that. I don't know what you mean when you say, when you keep saying, think about it. Yeah. What do you mean? And it dawned, that was a moment like when it dawned yeah. on the teacher that... There's more to to what thinking is than just saying think about it. Yeah. Which which I think is like really it was so it's just such a profound moment because so much of what we see out in the world today, even even twenty something years later, yeah, is like oh well just analyze that. Yeah. Oh, well, what do you mean by analyze that? What what does analyze what does mean? mean? What does it mean? Yeah. What what do we mean when evaluate we say it. have analytical yeah. skills? Yep. Like what evaluate that. You know, or uh, go think about that, or yeah. And this kid, this kid was saying it. He was sort of exposing. Like, what do you mean, what do you mean when you say think about it? Mm -hmm. What exactly am I supposed to do? Yes. And we were showing them the answer to that question. So she what had an exactly? Answer. She had an answer. She had an answer, and she was like, ah. "Oh, yeah. Now I get it. Yeah. That's now another I get great it. moment. Now I get why I'm why I've been practicing. You know, practicing these things. Mm -hmm. That was a cool moment." Yeah, there were a lot of good moments from that. Yeah, yeah. There was another one where, uh, you know, this a lot. A lot I may I, I don't know if these are in. Uh, was it in the documentary film? There's my favorite from the documentary film. Yeah. Remember Michaela? So the, there, there was a documentary, an educational documentary done on our work, yeah. uh, rethinking, yeah. by uh, the director Deborah Ward. Yes. Great director and great, great film. Uh, you and I were both standing there, Michaela. Actually, Deb was filming. Oh, right. And Michaela, I don't, this girl, Michaela, was probably in first or second grade. Adorable child. Yeah. I mean, they're all adorable, you know me. Um, and she came up to us and she was saying how she had done, she had used thinking. So they yeah. just called it thinking, right? Yeah. Which it is. She had used thinking to make her story about 
fish. And then she came up to her, she goes, this is my story about fish, and this is the, how I related my fish to this, and I took this perspective. Like, she's using these words. Yeah. And then she says to me and you, she says, but, and, and I'm so glad Deb caught this on film. She said, but then I realized I could do the same thing with my math homework. That's right. And she's like... And then she says, which means, and she lights up and she goes, I can do this about everything. About everything. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's the it. moment. There it is. She yeah. had it. So it was like she had this little toolkit now yeah. on her back, grade to grade, topic to topic. She's and always going to be able to do it. Yeah. And I mean, these actually, these are fun stories. These are good stories. Those were good. That was good. That was a good experience. Yeah, there was the time uh, that made me think of the time where we, we they had a, I don't even know. It was like third grade or something with the hel- uh, the firemen. Oh, no. That was pre-K. That was pre-K. Three and four-year-olds. Three and four-year-olds. Yeah. So they do uh, they do what's called the standard is like um, community, community helpers. Helper. Yep. That's right. And, um, you know, it's like there's a bunch of different community helpers, yeah. police, firemen, doctors, house, doctors whatever. Not so lawyers. they they usually have the firemen come out with the fire truck and yeah. the firemen come with their uniforms. Oh, and the and kids love it and the mailmen come and all that. So this one particular class had been doing this for years and years and years. And, uh, you know, she she this teacher had done it many times where the firemen come with the yes. trucks. And then then the kids build a, a fire truck out of uh, cardboard, cardboard and in their room, jugs and- milk jugs yeah. and stuff. And and then they draw a, f- a fire truck and they label yeah. things. Yes, and so right. she taught them a. She took one of the patterns of thinking, s, s-, s- or systems, part, part whole. whole. Yeah. And she taught them this this very simple song, which was like something to the effect of every whole can be broken into parts, and every one of the yeah. parts could be a whole that gets broken into parts. It was so literally that. I'm not going to sing that. it. I'm not allowed yeah. to sing on camera. <laughs> so the kids sing this little song for like a minute. Yeah. Every right? whole has parts. Yeah. Every part has a whole. Yeah. So literally the treatment was like a minute. Yeah, a you song. Know, a song. And then the kids go out to the fire truck. That's right. And they go like, you know, what do you see, basically? And the mm-hmm. kids... This year, when they had been taught the song, they've been taught metacognitively to to do this on purpose. Yeah. Their descriptions were so much more advanced, so many more terms. And right. their, the actual fire truck that they built yeah. was more complex. They usually had a front and a back and a yeah. steering wheel and wheels. And this yeah. time they had a ladder. And then the kids, I remember the kids, they said, well, but it's not just a ladder. The ladder has two ladders. Yeah. So it was two a two part ladder. Right. And then they said, and the the those ladders have yeah. these things in the that go yeah. across. They learned. They didn't the even know the words but for these things, it, but yeah. they knew the parts. Right. Right. And then they knew to search for the words, so they learned yes. new vocabulary yes. on top of that because they had the structure and they needed a word to yes. to put in there. And then they said, and even the the cross things. The rungs. The rungs, yeah. which they learned. But at first, they just called them cross things. The things, The yeah. things. And, and then they learned the word rung. They have grippy stuff. Mm-hmm. They have grippy stuff on them. That's right. Right? So they're seeing And more so parts. they were seeing more and more parts. Parts yes. of parts of parts. Yeah. Such a simple thing, but they, they were able to... Uh, I don't want to lose the simplicity, get lost in the simplicity of that story, because what that meant is because they learned one one of these ways of thinking differently, they saw more parts of the fire truck. Then in their work, they had more parts in the thing they built. And then they had more, because there were more parts, they had to find words for those parts. Yeah, so their vocab. Right. And so when that, so then they kept that group of kids with the same teacher for kindergartner. Remember this? And then the school district called us and they said, we need you to come down and help us uptrain the first grade teacher we're going to keep these kids together because their scores are so advanced, are so much higher. Yes. The benchmarks, yes. I should yeah, say, not benchmarks. scores, because they were yeah. they're not into testing yet. So they actually literally kept them together, together. and they had to up train, and they had to up train the first grade teacher yeah. Yeah. so that she could keep that thread. That's right. So they were like little superstars. Yeah, yeah, and that that actually was the same group that. Um, oh, do you yeah. remember they had? Uh, yeah. Later that, so we did the the fire truck thing. Then later that that um, 
a couple weeks later, the school year, yeah, in the, in the school year, they had a lockdown, which is, I guess, you know, like a some threat, and it wasn't, a, it didn't end up being anything, but yeah. but the threat caused them to have to lock the doors, and yeah, they have a whole protocol. They go to the back of the room and all this stuff, and, they have to be and it's pretty. Pretty yeah. scary for little kids. It's terrifying. Not terrifying. Four years old. Well, so one of the kids comes up after the lockdown's over. The kid comes up to the teacher and says, "Hey, Miss uh, Wilson, or whatever. <laughs> it's always Miss Wilson." Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because Miss Wilson was this like terrible teacher that I had. We'll talk about that in yeah. a second. <laughs> anyway, so I don't know why I call it Miss Wilson because this was a really good teacher. Um, so. Uh, Miss Smith, Smith, whatever. Uh, the the kid comes up to her and she says, uh, "Hey, Miss Smith, can we part hold the lockdown?" Right. From and the then song. they broke the the lockdown into parts, and these are the things we do, and these are the things we think, and they, you know, blah blah blah. And so she had she had used the same structure that they used on fire trucks on some completely different information without. Being asked to—that's transfer. That's called far transfer in the in the vernacular. Yeah. So, um, and that's a really important thing. That's like the uh, that's like the holy grail of, of learning theory is far yeah. transfer, right? Because yeah. when you when you can transfer something you learn in one scenario to another, to another totally distant scenario, then uh, you can teach yourself. You know, instead of learning one thing at a time, you can teach yourself. 20 things at a time because right. you learn one thing and you can transfer it to lots of places. Right. So she had done that. But then. I know. I know, you know where you're going. I'm going. Yeah, yeah. So then we get an email like, I don't know, a couple of weeks later. And it says it's the same group. I think it was months. Kids, months, whatever. Your um, sense of time. Is yeah, my sense of time is crazy. <laughs> so, so I get an email and it says, Dear Dr. Cabrera. This is the, you know class and mrs and, smith's uh, class mrs. smith's class and blah 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 and we are we went to an apple orchard yep and we decided to part whole the apple yes and we discovered a number of parts of the apple and here they are and they named all the parts yeah but one picture. of the parts we were wondering because it was pretty new to us <laughs> if scientists at cornell have know about this part <laughs> we wanted to let him know <laughs> and we wanted to let him know about this part right and we have taken the liberty to they didn't say liberty but they no. basically they had taken the liberty to uh to name the part yes i remember and the name that they had given this part which was the fuzzy bit at the end wow. of the apple yeah um is the belly button it's a apple. great name. It's a great name. I think we should the belly button of the head. apple. Yeah, right? and we just wanted to know. In the does email, anybody else know? About does this? anybody else know about <laughs> it? Could you, you know, ask your science friends or whatever? And so I, I was like, oh, interesting. So I, I actually contacted one of the people in genomics. Yeah, and I said, you know, what? Give what me a little this? background on on this stuff. And and she said, oh, that's the uh, that's the calyx. It's part of the flower structure, and it ends yeah. up at the end of the apple, yeah, yeah. right? And we call it the calyx, yeah. C A L Y X, right? Yeah. And yeah, you know, which is kind of a big technical science word, but I thought belly button was a pretty good name for it. And belly button is easier to remember, easier and it certainly remember. structurally looks like a. Belly <laughs> it kind of I mean, it's a fuzzy, a belly. fuzzy belly, belly button with a bunch of lint in it. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Which for kids, Which for is kids probably, is probably right. true to, to <laughs> form. So, so they these kids were like, I wrote them back. I said, it turns out, yeah, you know, it's great that you broke down the apple, but but it, would they they do know about it, yeah. and they call it the calyx. So then we went back months later, and they were all using the word <laughs> calyx and stuff. A bunch of kindergartners using the word. Calyx. But what's interesting about that story is pretty. It's pretty important. Is that yeah. far transfer? Right. Yeah. Far transfer again is like the holy grail of learning theory, right? And what those kids had done was they took an abstract structure of part whole infinite inf, ad infinitum, part right. whole going up and part whole going down. Every whole has parts, and every part can be a whole that has yeah. ensuing parts and vice versa going upward in scale. Yeah. They took that basic concept, and there's a couple more that they learned, but that was one, they and they just that. applied yeah. it. <clears throat> In so many different places, without the teacher even encouraging them to, mm -hmm. and they learned, 
all kinds of things that they wouldn't have learned as a result of it because they're thinking. Right, right. And, and I think uh, we should go up a level here and talk about that's not the norm. That wasn't the norm. No. In that school. No. I mean, that school district called us and said, we want to focus on developing thinking skills and move beyond just content memorization. And so they had a whole, school, you know, district. I mean, we were there for years, a yeah. district wide effort yeah. to get that. But I mean, I mean, that's not typically how. I mean, you know, we have three kids that just went through the whole school system and we went through the school system. And for us, it was all about memorizing stuff. Yeah, I think uh, one of the one of the things that I'm uh, fond of challenging, you know, superintendents and principals and, and, and folks with is, you know, imagine imagine that you're standing at the front of your school district right. in the morning. Mm -hmm. And all the buses are coming and all the parents are dropping all the kids off. It doesn't matter what grade. It could be high school. It could be, could be college. You know, <laughs> it could be, could be anything. could be a Any Fortune school, 500. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, just, to, you know, kind of close your eyes and imagine all the buses showing up, all the cars showing up, all these kids getting out. And they're all on this particular day. They're all wearing plain white T-shirts. Yes. Right? Yeah. And every T-shirt says awaiting instructions in big black letters mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. if that's true about these these kids if they're just there to awaiting instructions right right mm -hmm. then how would you build your school how would you design your school how would you design curriculum how would you design tests how would you design what kind right. of teachers would you hire how what kind of you know how would you interact with the kids every single detail of the school can can be taken from that that sort right. of trait, right? Yeah. But now imagine, same day, they all show up with white t-shirts, but instead of awaiting instructions, it says, under construction. Mm. Yeah. And and how would that change the way all you design that. your school, the way you design your curriculum, the way you think about information, all that kind of stuff? And I think that is really important because... The human mind is not awaiting instructions. It's not waiting for information. It's under construction. It's constantly, con it's taking in information and it's building it, right? Yeah. It's, you know, Maria Montessori talked about the absorbent mind mm -hmm. and people talk about the, the brain being like a sponge. The brain's really nothing like a, sp mm -hmm. a sponge. It's a, it's a terrible metaphor. Um, the, the, the brain really... If you're going to think about it as a metaphor, is like a construction site. Uh, you know, there, it's taking raw information, which is the building materials, yeah. two by fours and nails yeah, yeah. and stuff, and then it's and then it's structuring that information to make meaning to build it, something to build like something, that. and right. it can build all kinds of things. Right. Uh, and so, under construction is a much more uh, appropriate. appropriate metaphor. And well, if you think about yeah. our whole school system, think about it: instructional design. Yeah, yeah. Coverage right? curriculum. Coverage curriculum. It's all about what we're covering, mm -hmm. what information we're giving them, what the teachers saying or doing at the front of the room. What are we instructing? Right. Not what are they learning. Not what are they building, right? Yeah. But what are we teaching? What are yes. we instructing? What are they away? What are they getting tested on? It's all information based. Yeah, and way way back, I would imagine, and I mean way way back, that was sort of sufficient because things weren't changing that fast. And information, like right now, you learn something now and. Before you know it, that inf something has changed, right? Because sure. things with the you know global exchange of information and like just things we have like almost too much information. Sure. So yeah. if, if teaching and learning is only about information, well, what you learn today is not going to be true tomorrow, right? It's going to keep moving. Yeah. So it makes sense that you should be focusing on how people are coming to understand information. So that as the information changes, they still have facility with it, right? 
they still have the ability to well, and knowledge. The, yeah, you contrast that with the, the, the utter lack of value that information basically has today, right? If you have if you have a an exponential amount of information, then the, the value of any given piece yeah. of information is far less, right? right. So because there's so much, you know, of it. if you think about a taxi cab driver, right? Like yeah. you know, in the old days, uh, the, the value of a taxi cab driver is that they knew information about the city, they but now the they don't city. need to know information about yep. the city because we have a little device there that that tells them like where to go and etc. Gives them the information they right. need. Yeah. So the information is really not that important. Is a good chance that the information that we learn today is going to be you know, essentially irrelevant, outdated, outdated, quickly, very quickly. Yeah. If, I mean, not even by the time they get to their careers, uh, you know, tomorrow it yeah. can be outdated. For real. So what exactly are we educating? And I think it, for me, it really comes down to this very simple equation of what I call M equals IO. Yeah. Right. Well, um, which is mental models are equal to information and organization. Right. Right. So when we organize information, we make meaning or mental models. And meaning is important. Right. Information, you know, may or may not be important. But the way we organize that information to make meaning is what is useful. Right. Uh, so so really what we should be focused on is are we building are we are we developing humans, future adults? Yes who are really good at organizing information, really good at taking information, yeah. sometimes information that is disorganized and organizing it into meaningful ways. Right. And if we do that, we're we're creating things that can't be replaced by AI. Wow, that's a We're creating thing. skills that yeah. that won't be replaced by AI. Yeah, but I remember yes, and but the thing that's nice about that with that equation is because the that means that everybody's building meaning, mm -hmm. right? And they might be building different meaning out of the same stuff. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Which means teachers and educators, uh, if they if they focus on developing the thinking skills or the things that kids need to know to organize information to build meaning, then there's not that sort. They don't have to like differentiate all of the curriculum, right? They're just teaching them the same thinking Same skills and, and, and the kids will will develop that understanding and meaning on their own because they have that as sort of a a toolkit that's right right for understanding anything that's right which is why Michaela could do transfer right yeah. because yeah. she she had those the facility with on how she, she understood how she understood things that's right right and we saw that over and over again that transfer yeah. that high far transfer Far meaning, you know, you learn something in one domain and then you transfer it to a completely different informational domain. Right. I don't know if you remember the kid that literally asked us, uh, it, this was in a re residential treatment center. So these kids were, yeah. you know, having all kinds of problems. And um, and the kid was learning stuff in therapy Yes. about thinking and metacognition and the, the patterns of, of thinking. And he, he asked... Uh, us through his journaling he said is it okay literally asked i'm finding these things very useful in therapy and i'm wondering is it okay if i use them in biology right, <laughs> right. right. you know i'm right. taking a class in biology and he wasn't sure it was it okay to, to transfer those to skills. use <laughs> yeah. something that was useful over here over here right and this is what we're teaching kids in a in a weird sort of way we're teaching them that these that these disciplines are separate right you know that biology is not, you know, psychology, and that <laughs> that math is not. Uh, you Do you know, remember that teacher? Biology. We were working with. Yeah. Who said, we were, every once in a while we would have interesting conversations, and she had all the best intentions. She goes, "Oh, I used, I used, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I used, um, these thinking skills in English on Wednesday, but I didn't use it in math." On um, Friday. Fridays, yeah. <laughs> and then we're, she sort of caught herself. She's like, oh, I probably should use, use it all the time. That's right. Right? That they're not, they're not domain specific. They're not subject specific. These skills are cut across. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I think it required a little bit of, of coaching. 
Yeah. Because I, mean, I said, yeah. just say that sentence again. Yeah. Let's say I use thinking uh, in, in, what was it, English, English on, on Wednesdays. Wednesdays. But I don't use thinking in math on Fridays. Right. And, and when she repeated it that she said, way, she was she like, said, hmm. maybe that doesn't make sense. We should probably use thinking. Yeah, but, well. I mean, you got to love teachers. God, what they're oh. dealing with, this, the, the sort of the systemic, just like the, yeah, the rules rough. and the regs and, and the standards they have to meet. You know, they they get into teaching because they love teaching, and then they end up in this. They love the kids. Bureaucracy. They love the teaching. Yeah, and then they end up in this thing that that is is testing on information, covering yeah. information, forces them to you know to sort cover its curriculum, yeah. and it's very antiquated. Yeah, it's not the teachers. I mean, no. I think that's a big misnomer to to a lot of. Uh, for a lot of folks is that they think the teachers are driving this. The teachers hate it. Teachers are heroes. Teachers are, yeah. I mean, they're, It's like they're a notable profession. Crazy, you know, and noble. everyday crazy pressures from all sides to do, yeah. you know, essentially things that they know aren't the most effective things to do. And the teachers right. know what the effective yeah. things to do are. And uh, a lot of times they they, they don't have the, the sort of uh, range the resources, the resources or the support or to support to do it to actually use their expertise yeah in teaching like yeah. you know you, you've said before i think somewhere i saw we quoted you where you said you know we teach humans yeah. not subjects right yeah. and right now the school system as it's designed and was designed which is why we need to modernize it a bit it was designed oh. to teach subjects and to get kids ready for factories and it was in you know in, in a time and an age where these were the things that they needed to learn. I'm Eric. Yeah, Lee. if you if you I mean the history is pretty important because if you if you think about the in the agrarian age, the, the agricultural age, right when most most families were going out on the on the farm, work in the fields, mm -hmm. and you know most families had a lot of kids because they needed a lot of help on the farm. So you yeah. had, even though they weren't super wealthy, they would have 10, 12, 13 yeah. kids, <laughs> you know? And as soon as those kids were of, of age to be able to swing a whatever, they were out working. Well, yeah. the kids that weren't of age would stay home with, with mom mm -hmm. and mom would, you know, bake and do other things, get ready for dinner, or get ready for lunch yeah. or whatever. Take care of the house. Take care of the house. And they would take which care of the kids. Which is a lot of work. Which is a lot of work, yeah. <laughs> And, and feed all these people yes. that were going to be very hungry after yeah. working all day. So what they did was they created kind of the first school, one-room schoolhouses school. where they said, well, instead of having every mom take kid duty, let's have one mom sort of Med facilitate kid. many kids, yeah. right? And those were the first one-room schoolhouses. Yeah. And if you think about that for a second, what the, the need was babysitting. Right. Right. Custodial the need care. was custodial care. Right. So people could work. So people could work. And right. we saw this this need kind of poke its head out of, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of that's underneath. Yeah. But during COVID, we saw that where, right, right, where that's people right. needed to go back to work or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they were like, what, what do I do with my kids? You yeah. know? Like, they're not going to yeah. school or whatever. So that was sort of the, the beginning of the agrarian level a school and then we as you mentioned we move into the the, the factory age yeah. the industrial age and what do we need there we need people that can follow instructions yes right awaiting instructions stay on schedule stay on schedule do the job kind of taylorism kind of yeah. stuff right oh, like God. just the you know the just bells. do what you're told yeah Get that, that's why we have clocks and, and bells, bells and brakes mm -hmm. and all that in the school system um and, you know, we really haven't updated our schools very much. Mm -mm. No. That we haven't updated them very much. The only schools that have really gotten updated are the ones that the, the extremely wealthy send their children to, and they teach their children to think. Yeah. No, that's right. Right? Well, yes. In those schools. In those In schools. those schools, right. But we haven't updated the, the schools. Uh, all of the schools. All of the schools. The public schools. Public schools. I remember one time. To be what we need in society, yes. which is people that can think. Yeah, and do you remember um, there was a moment or we maybe were... we don't want people to think. Oh, no, that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> but 
But you remember we were talking to superintendent of a very large district in Virginia that we spent years at, right? Yeah. And I remember she said, one thing she said to me, it stuck with me forever, and she said, the reason we really want to focus on thinking in this district is because thinking levels. is the great equalizer. Yeah, levels of playing. Because they had a wide range of so socioeconomic true. status, and they had a lot of kids that were struggling because they were, you know, disadvantaged mm -hmm. and, you know, would show up with empty bellies. And she's like, but if we can teach all of them to think, then they're yeah. all in the same place, and That's we're going right. to bridge those gaps that are causing these societal problems down the road. Yep. And to me, that was like so true. The the best thing. It's the great equalizer. It's the great yeah. equalizer. Teach people yeah. to think, and they can do. Yeah. And yeah. It, and what's interesting is, I think you and I are. How would I say this? Examples of school experiences that are the exact opposite. For sure. Right. Like yeah. you struggled in school. Very much. School was was. The opposite of, of what it was for you, your school was a haven from, yeah, for you, for me, kind of a haven from not a great home life. Yes, yes. And for me, it was, uh, school was the like the opposite. My home life was fantastic and I, it was all about learning. And then I would go to school and the contrast was really upsetting. You know? Right. Because back then they didn't understand difference no, they didn't. in students at all. They didn't, I don't even think the word neurodiversity no. existed. No. And they thought everybody should get it the same way, the yeah. same time. It's like asking a fish to climb a tree. Yeah. So you they... were kind of labeled. Yeah. Massively badly. Labeled. Yeah. And mistreated, in yeah. my opinion. Death by a thousand paper cuts. Well, it's interesting for those people who know you now. Yeah. The fact that, you know, you went through school with such differences that were um, literally undiagnosed. Yeah. I mean, they were undiagnosed because I don't, I don't even think, I mean, the, the, psychological the dsm-5 yeah. or whatever it was then dsm-2 or 3 right. <laughs> didn't even have right adhd or or autism, autism or any yeah. of that spectrum disorders or uh misophonia or any of it was wasn't yeah. even we didn't know about it yeah and if you if you relate that back to your earlier contrast of awaiting instructions versus under construction mm -hmm. I was thinking, think about how that makes the student feel, how disempowering it is to a student to just Completely. to be sitting in a pool of everybody's expected to be the same and are expected to absorb instructions yeah. and just process it all the same. And there you are, you know, literally the fish being asked to climb the tree. But think of how hard it is for us mm -hmm. because we, you know, we we have the advantage of seeing what our school system creates. Yes. The most successful what what is perceived as the most successful yeah. of our school system, right? Because we we're in the Ivy League and it's not easy to get into the Ivy League. Right. So these are the people that admittedly have succeeded in this system. They've done everything they were told to do and yep. and they did it the way they were told to do it and they succeeded. Yep. So they got access to you know, Ivy League schools. Yeah. And think of how long it takes us to get them to stop raising their hand to yeah. speak. Right? <laughs> to actually like, speak. Why, you know, and, and it's it's a shock to them. That, like, mm -hmm. you know, why why would we raise our hands to speak? Right. We we don't raise our hands to speak in any other social setting. We we wait for a pause or, you know, we have it's all the natural, skills yeah. to sort of naturally communicate with each other. But we they are don't need this, our permission. They don't need our permission to speak. Yeah. But it's it's indoctrinated into them. Yes. And well, you know they're very good at taking tests. Mm -hmm. You can give them any test and they'll ace it. Yeah, and they just I think a lot of it is, I mean, just like the kindergartners, you need to teach people how to articulate their thinking, how to yeah. understand their thinking, how to articulate it. Um, and and also, you know, for us, because we're in a graduate teaching a graduate to push, yeah. to extend and interrogate, sort of push their thinking even more. And that's not something they were taught pro previously. They weren't even encouraged to do that previously. No. So we've done a lot of work in schools. And I think a lot of that work, I mean, to be honest, was motivated by your experience 
inside of the system. Once I, once I understood uh, that I, w what that there was so something different that about, the way, about yeah. the way that I my brain worked, then I was able to work with my brain and and actually a huge part of the discovery of DSRP and the discovery of these these ideas was motivated by just literally getting trying to survive in the world um and right. make it so that my brain would work yeah in in a more uh it, you know in in both the way that it worked but also in a way that would satisfy neurotypical people you know normal right. people uh <laughs> Uh, normal is so. not really a good word anymore. <laughs> well, you know. neuro to normative. normal, like normative, normative like yes. not, not bad, just, yeah. just the norm. Right. So. so I guess in a way, thankfully for all of us, your, your sort of um, effort or quest to understand Struggle. your own yeah. self and how you came to understand things as a, as you know, with your neurodiversity mm -hmm. actually has led to this great thing, which is this universal way of understanding how we understand things that now not only does it level the playing field sort of academically it it kind of levels the playing field neurologically because we can all understand how we understand things we're, yeah. all, we're all understanding things the same way and socioeconomically it levels right. the playing right. field i mean it levels right. the playing field period if you can think yeah and if you can outthink uh, you know, other people, then there's that's good. Very little that you can't do. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's it definitely levels the playing field. I mean, I think, yeah. um, and you know, I guess there's a certain part of it that I I, I call my my educational career or whatever it was, my time in education, my time in school was like death by a thousand paper cuts. I mean, it was like right. there's no. There's no obvious trauma, but there was like trauma by, by just slow like trickle. slow trickle. And, um, you know, I, I, it would be nice if that didn't happen to people, um, uh, right. today. Like there's no, we're wasting a lot of really great human, potential. human potential by doing that. And in a way by, by focusing on developing metacognition or understanding how somebody's thinking about something we can speak to sameness yeah in education rather than try to cater to difference and also admonish difference right completely we can speak underneath all of that in that similarity because we all understand things the same way the same way yeah this this idea that we um, think differently is just an absurdity yeah. it's 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 a popular absurdity but it's an absurdity it's like saying we breathe differently and right. we our heart works differently it really doesn't like right. at some maybe micro level we, all of our hearts are different and some extremely micro level our lungs are different but for all intents and purposes, you know, a heart surgeon can can work on any heart, and yeah. because they're all the same, and and a brain right. surgeon can work on any brain because they're all the same, and our thinking is the same. It's you know, there there are universal patterns of thinking. Now, what we think could totally be different. wildly different. I can think about that's, knitting, and you can wonderful. think about yeah, but how we science. think is patterned. And if yeah. it wasn't patterned, by the way, there would be no use for science, right? If there's no pattern to the way we think, right, then there would be there, there would be no purpose in searching for any kind of uh, science to it. There would if it was just completely random, yeah, and everybody was just randomly different. Like there would wild be no wild west. Yeah, if it's, if it, <laughs> it'd be chaos. Yeah, it'd be chaos. So, huh? I studied under one of the great evolutionary biologists. Yes. His name was Will Provine, an yeah. amazing man, uh, a great mentor to me. Um, and and we discovered in one of Darwin's, Darwin probably came up with one of the most important theories in science uh, that we know of today, you know, yeah. uh, still today, one of the greatest thoughts that's ever been had by a human mind. And uh, he wrote in one of his journals, believer in these views will pay great attention to education. And what he meant is, if you understand my theory of evolution, you know, this, mm -hmm. which is an incredible theory in and of itself, you will pay incredible attention to education because that 
is the driver of societies. That is the driver of futures. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of quotes that say that, but we don't seem to believe it. We don't seem to really know it. And it is true that if we don't pay great attention to education, if we don't start fixing it ASAP, if we don't change it to be, uh, you know, better, yeah, and, and more in alignment with the times, then um, it is the driver of societies. Well, not just more in alignment with the times, but also more in alignment with the reality of how we all function and how we yeah. all learn and how we all evolve. That's right. And that could change society entirely. Completely. And you're seeing it today. I mean, I, I, you'll, you'll remember when we worked with, we taught a course at a local uh, high school and in the, in, as the project. Yeah. We said, let's design, let's redesign the education system. And what's remarkable is those kids knew instantly what exactly. to do. They said, we want to be adults in training, training. Uh, mm-hmm. not students. Yep. We want to have uh, guides, not, uh, not teachers. Yep. And we want real life skills that are going to, that we really need to be adults. Yes. You know, that's, that's what we want. They wanted to be prepared. They wanted to be prepared. And they knew it. They knew what they needed. They yeah. knew how to redesign it. We all know how to redesign it. We all know that's needed. And and when we talk to executives and we talk to business folks and people on the on the consuming side of, of, of what education yeah. creates, they all say, we, we have to retrain them. They're not yeah. coming to us with the ability to think and yeah. all this kind of stuff. When we talk to parents, they say, you know, yeah, what am I sending my kid to? Like, it's right. it's not working. He's not learning He's learning all these negative things and blah, right. blah, blah. Because it's all about instructions and When we talk to teachers, they're yeah. frustrated with what they're mm-hmm. being subjected to. I mean, just want who's to happy with it? Nobody I know is happy with it. I don't know. I don't know why we don't. Uh, well, we all know exactly what to do. I know there's do. probably a few people that are happy with Who? The curriculum yeah, companies. Yeah, I don't know. The curriculum companies. <laughs> the ones okay. that send all of the yeah, exactly. the coverage curriculum. Yeah. They're making a lot of money. They're making a lot of money. Off of that. And the, the, you know, the people that put an iPad and a computer in every kid's lap that they don't need. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Big business of some sort. Remember when our kids had to memorize this uh, capitals of, uh, of every uh, county in New yeah, York state, or something? 62 counties. That's a question I've never been asked in a job interview. What's the county? No. Of, you know, and our future doesn't How many depend counties on are there in New York? I think it's 62. <laughs> okay, well, I think they all remember that because, <laughs> because we literally made like <laughs> flashcards of them. Yeah. All. Mm-hmm. But we're focused on that information. And the whole, you know, it's very simple. It's very simple. Yeah. Our system, if we take that equation, M equals IO, meaning or mental models equals information in our organization. Organization is the is the thing that we do with thinking. Thinking yes. is organization. We organize information to make meaning. That's yes. what thinking is, right? Yep. Our school system is entirely based on information. Right. Teaching information, testing information, memorizing information. Yes. Information is abundant all around us. So information is just like the, the norm. Yeah. What we should be focused on is teaching thinking, yes. teaching kids to organize information. And what information? Doesn't matter. Whatever information they're interested in, which would engage the kids more. Because it, it doesn't matter what the information is. There, it's, just... it's definitely not going to be the counties of New York. No. Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe for some. Maybe a few. He's really interested in the counties of New maybe York, in which case he can great. study the, the counties of New York. Right. But for most kids, it's going to be something else. Right. And so let them study whatever they want to study. Let them figure out what the things that they, what interests them. Yeah. And let them organize that information. Well, and be excited and about be excited education about and learning yes. and, and to feel like it's all of it's possible. All of it's possible. Right. And because, yeah. If they learn to organize information, which is thinking. Yes. If they learn to think in order to organize information to make meaning, then they will be prepared for any adulthood, that's for right. any future. Yep. And they, they will be prepared. Yep. And that's what these kids knew. We want, we're adults in training. Yeah. We're adult. We're not employees in training. We're adults in training. Right. We're not just designed to be employees of something. I'm not just trying to go get a job in life. We're adults in training. And that sort of weird, that metaphorical 
backpack or toolkit of metacognition yeah. all the way through their life. Yeah. Not Teach just in school. Think. All the way through. It's super simple. Yeah. We just have to have the will to do it. We do. We'll get there. I think we'll get there. We'll get there. I think we'll get there. All right, that's a high note. Let's let's end on let's that. Let's end on that high note. That's a wrap. That that's a, a wrap. That's a wrap. Right there. Wrap Everything's it. possible. The world will get better. <laughs> rainbows and unicorns unicorn and rainbows kitty. and glitter. My favorite <laughs> unicorn kitty, for sure. Uh, unicorn kitty out. <laughs>